Good afternoon. I am Xingyu. Thank you for agreeing to do this inter interview with me. I'm doing a project about social history project. So mm, it, it is basically in, in interview who had real experience about the wars or the similar situations. Can we start with your name and your job? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, Roland, or I go by Ron Johnston. I'm the uh, the father of, of Michael Johnston there at the, the house where you're at. <clears throat> and I am currently retired. Yep. So you, you were a pilot before. How did you become interested in becoming a pilot? <clears throat> well, I went through uh, ROTC at Kansas State University, graduated in 69. And I'd, and I'd gone through the PIT or the pilot indoctrination program. So when I was commissioned and graduated from college, my first assignment was to go to Laredo Air Force Base in Texas to go to undergraduate pilot training. And that was about a year long. We went down there in August to August. Um, and when I graduated, um, I was assigned to a, a B-52 out of uh, Blyville, Arkansas. <clears throat> so after some uh, training and, and uh, we ended up we ended up there at Blyville then. Uh, so that's kind of how I got into being you know an Air Force pilot. Yeah, and why did you choose to become a pilot? Well, um, again, you know, it wasn't really a choice in the matter. You know, once I had taken the, the, the PIT indoctrination training and went to Laredo and graduated, uh, it was a matter of kind of doing what they told you to do and what they had trained you to do. So there really, there wasn't a whole great deal of thought, you know, ahead of time you know, about being a pilot. Uh, now, Michael, when he was 12 years old, he came to me and he told me that he wanted to be a fighter pilot. So he had made his mind up, you know, a long time before he ever got the chance to do that. So he's currently living his dream today, too. Uh, but he planned for it, worked for it. Well, I just went through school and that's just kind of ha what happened, you know, circumstances that happened. Do you have to become a pilot for the military after you graduate from that school? Uh, because I went through the, the PIT program, the answer was yes. <clears throat> now, when I got to Laredo and started going through school down there, you know, I, I had the option of, of uh, not being a pilot. I could have, you know, volunteered to, to not go through the, the whole program and then they would have reassigned me over to a different job, but I didn't do that. Yeah, so I read some stories you wrote and I saw your experiences during the Vietnam War. What was it like to become a B-50 pilot during the Vietnam War? Well, the, uh, the, the, the process of training was, was probably close to, to two years by the time you go through all of the, the requirements. Uh, um, and then we we finally got settled in there in, in Blyville, <clears throat> and then when it got turned our turn to to deploy because the SAC Strategic Air Command was supporting uh, air operations in in Vietnam through Operation ArcLight, uh, so you had airplanes deployed over there and they were taking crews off of the individual <laughs> SAC bases and sent them over to be uh, requalified into the D model uh, B-52, which is being used in the war effort. Uh, so uh, that's kind of how we got over there. Uh, we were going over on uh, six months orders. You were over there for six months, you were back home for 30 days, then back over again, and I did that four times. Wow. And um, how did you deal with the stress of flying combat? <clears throat> the, 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 the first part of it really wasn't a whole lot of stress it, per se, other than 
you know, it, they were long sorties, um, demanding, um, but they weren't, you know, technically difficult or physically difficult. And then when you were there at uh, uh, Anderson Air Force Base in Guam, we flew every through day and then you had, you know, <clears throat> you know, two days off. So you had plenty of time for to rest and go to the beach and play in the sand and and whatever. Um, but when we deployed to uh, Utapau, Thailand, in the middle of the second tour, then there we were flying six hour missions, but we were flying every day. And the, the, the mission requirements before the sortie and then the sortie itself and then the debriefing afterward, there was really no time to do anything except um, because you had 12 hours, you had to be in crew rest 12 hours before you go fly again. So that means you just come off of one sortie, went into crew rest and got something to eat and went to bed and got up and went to work the next day and did that for 21 days straight before you got a couple of days break. So how how long did you stay in Vietnam and Thailand? Uh, <clears throat> well, I had uh, in Guam, I had uh, one and a half tours. And then in Utapau, I had uh, one and a half tours, um, you know, flying missions there. And then um, I got my arm broke um, when I was in uh, on the third tour there in, in Utapau. And so they sent me home and then I recovered from that. And then I went back to Guam and I spent the last tour in Guam as a, a spare pilot. <clears throat> is it the time you met your family when your arm is broken? Yeah, I got I got about six weeks or so there that I got to spend home and, and with my family, you know, that that really helped, you know. Yeah. And how many days you you stayed with your family when your wife is pregnant or your son is to be born? Well, in between tours, the tours were six months long with 30 days in between. And most of that 30 days you had off uh, on leave and you could spend that time pretty much with your family. In this case, Linda was pregnant <clears throat> with our second child. So I went to Topeka and stayed there with her, hoping that she would have the baby before I left. And your boss gave allowed you to have like some days with your wife and your new child? Yeah, that, you know, that was not, well, the, the commander, that was just what it was considered, you know, what, what you're going to do. So um, uh, when you were, when you were back home in the States in between the tours, Arclight, then you, know, you were pretty much most of that time you were off. And so you could spend most of that time with your families. And that was really important. You know, that was important time. Yeah. And during the war, I know there is a lot of deaths going on around you. Have you ever witnessed another B-52 getting shot down by your friends? Yes. Um, actually, I, I saw two B-52s get shot down. One of them was was my next door neighbor, you know, George Berry Lockhart, you know, um, uh, when I first got to, to Blyville, George is my next door neighbor, and um, the crew that I was on uh, was going to deploy to Arclight, and, but I wasn't combat ready, so he and I just swapped crews, and then we went about three, four months later. Uh, it was during the uh, December 11-day war Arclight, or uh, Linebacker 2 operation, which is the massive bombing com campaign against uh, North Vietnam at the time. Uh, he flew a, a G model B-52 out of uh, Anderson and, and their airplane, you know, suffered some damage. And so they uh, diverted into Utapau and that was where I was at at the time. And I was getting ready to go into crew control and, and start the, the paperwork and all the things you needed to do to, to, to fly your mission the next night. And, uh, George came over there to that hooch where I was at. And you you could buy sandwiches and uh, cokes and and uh, peanuts. They, they sold peanuts and you'd throw them at the ducks. 
And George and I sat there and talked for quite a little while uh, about family and what was going on. And, and so I knew that he was going to be launching about two airplanes ahead of me. Their call sign was Ash 2. Uh, and so we were uh, about 30 minutes behind him going into the, the rail yards over Hanoi. And I saw his B-52 get hit with two different uh, serviced air missiles and uh, explode and go to the ground. And there was um, each one of the injection seats has um, a beepers on them, which if you uh, if you eject out, then that beeper goes off and you know it's picked up on uh, on the radio, so uh, guard frequency. So you know that there would have been some su uh, uh, survivors, but there was no beepers. So we knew that there was no survivors off of that airplane, that particular airplane. Did you feel like shocked or sad after you well, saw that? Well, I guess shock was, you know, absolutely shock and disbelief, I guess, to a certain degree that you just saw your friends die because I knew all those people that were on that airplane. Uh, they were people that I was on crew with bef before. Um, and uh, yeah, I went into um, you know, some moments of almost sheer terror there, and um, there was some very hard prayerful moments at the time uh, going through there. You know, you know, praying to God that uh, to protect us because I knew that we were going to go through the same Sam site 30 minutes later, and there was no reason why. Our airplane shouldn't suffer the same same result as as uh, Barry's crew did. Yeah, and were you worry about your own life when you are flying after those? <clears throat> well, um, and I guess the answer to that would be yes. You know, because you you went into uh, you know, it was a very stressful few minutes there until you could recompose yourself after you'd saw your friend get shot down and die. Uh, and, and to get back to, to flying your own airplane, you know, we were a lead crew. We were leading nine, you know, additional B-52s behind us, you know. So, you know, my job as a co-pilot was to coordinate all of the communications between the airplanes and, and coordinate the help the pilot fly the airplane and, and do those sort of things. So I had to get back, get my head back in the group in the uh, in, and fly in the airplane and just doing the sorting. And um, do you feel like God is supporting you through all of those? <clears throat> well, uh, actually, I think that the only reason why, you know, I was praying pretty hard there. Uh, and I had been a Christian for, for quite some time uh, by then. A lot of times I didn't act like I was a Christian, but I, but I was a believer. Uh, and I think God had mercy on us and, I, and our crew for, because, because uh, I prayed. Uh, when we went across the target area, uh, the same Sam site that shot down Barry's crew, uh, we turned into a post-target turn and uh, two SAM missiles come off of the ground, uh, serviced air missiles, and they were tracking us. Um, they had us locked on and there was no reason why that they shouldn't have hit us. Uh, in the process of trying to evade, you know, the missiles, we ended up turning the B-52 upside down. Um, and the, the, the I could look out the window and I could see the SAM missiles uh, going by, you know, so it was that close. And most of them were supposed to have proximity fuses, so they would have gone off and exploded, but they didn't. Um, we stalled the airplane out. Uh, we were able to get it flipped back over <clears throat> and we recovered back down at about uh, we were flying at about 43, 44,000 feet at the time when we went into the <clears throat> bomb run, and we covered, uh, we lost almost 20,000 feet, you know, trying to recover the airplane, and we were down in the area where 
the AAA was uh, very effective and the AAA really shot our airplane to pieces, including you know, a shell that went through and tore the back end of the, the uh, electronic warfare officer's ejection seat and blew a big hole through the side of the airplane. So we lost cabin pressurization. Uh, once we got out of the, the, um, the fire area where we could do a, a battle, you know, damage, nobody got hurt. There was nobody on the crew, but we, our airplane was completely shot to pieces. Um, we had fuel streaming out everywhere. Uh, we knew we had, you could see holes through the wings. Um, and uh, so we were moving fuel and checking, you know, what we what we had left. And, and uh, the, the, the airplane didn't look like it was structurally sound enough to fly, but it was flying. Uh, and it was still another four hours to get to <clears throat> back to Utapau. Um, uh, I computed you know, the, the fuel you know, based upon what we're using and what was leaking that we should we should have run out of fuel at least an hour uh, before we landed. So as we were coming back into the, the, the Utapau area, uh, we started the, the flaps down at a, a short little increments to make sure that the, the flaps would come down and we didn't have a split flap condition uh, and they would they would go down <clears throat> but they were they had had holes and you know, stuff into them shot up pretty bad uh, but they went down and then just before we uh, got ready to land then we put the gear down and all the gear went down and locked but when we landed uh, our as we were taxiing out all the airplanes shut down, you know, because we ran out of fuel. So um, the airplane wasn't structurally, you know, shouldn't have survived. Um, <clears throat> all of the shells, the AE, uh, AAA shells that they were shooting were high explosive incinerary, which meant that when they went through the airplane, they should have blown up. None of them blew up. None of the shells uh, exploded. Uh, the, the next morning after we landed, I went back down to the, the uh, runway and they'd had the airplane parked on the side and it was just about sunrise coming up and I could see the, the sun shining through the, uh, the airplane for all the holes and the shrapnel holes that was in the airplane. <clears throat> and they were scooping shrapnel out of the, the 47 section, which is the equipment bay section behind the, the bomb bay with scoop shovels uh, uh, into a dump truck. And I picked up some pieces of shrapnel from the airplane and, and gave it to the rest of our crew members. Um, that airplane never flew again. It, it, it was just too battle damaged. Uh, but the grace of God you know, brought us, brought us through. Um, so yeah, God was involved with that flight. And do you feel like your faith is much stronger right now than it is before? Well, absolutely yes, because what I what I experienced there was was God in action, and spared us uh, because we prayed, and it had a big impact on on the rest of my life, and so when I retired from from the military and retired from work, then I started a, a, a ministry with some other pastors and senior lay leaders called Seeking the Face of God Ministries, which is a, a writing ministry. And we have written uh, probably over 60 books and several hundred different articles and studies along with that to, to help be a ready source for people that become new Christians that has information available for them to read, to be able to help develop their, their faith. Yeah, that's really good. So, um, after the death of your friends, how did you feel like you're flying and how did you feel like your family if they without you? <clears throat> well, yeah, 
I really didn't have a whole lot of time to, to, to think about it other than, you know, later when we had a, when everybody got home and, and you know, the war was over for the B-52 crews, they had a, a memorial service um, there at Blyville because we had three airplanes out of Blyville got shot down and 19 men went to the ground. And we only recovered three, three of the of the 19. All the rest of them died. Um, most of their bodies were never recovered. Um, and I got a chance to talk to Barry's wife. You know, she was still in denial that you know that Barry was dead. That someplace he was still over there. And I told her that you know no, I saw his airplane get hit and explode and blow up and go to the ground in a ball of fire and there was no beepers that George, George is not coming back. Um, and I think she needed to hear that because she was living in denial. That's right. And did you regard like the time you missed with your family and your child? <clears throat> well, it, it wasn't just that time, but you know, the, the answer to your question is yes, you know, absolutely. But when I was in the military for 22 years, I was gone or TDY or not available to be with the family for a very large part of that. And that's the sacrifice of most of the military men and women that are in the service today. It's a really, a, there's a sacrificial cost of being able to do that service. And unfortunately, the, the families are the ones that kind of taken the blunt of that. Uh, so there was a lot of things that the the kids were doing that I missed out on. And some of the, you know, when the kids were first walking or their first words or being there to be able to take them to sports events or go to watch them at school and whatever they were doing. You know, yeah, you, I, I missed out on a lot of that. Yeah, and did you, um... Did you tell them that you you care about them and love them if they think, oh, my, my dad is not taking care of me? Well, one of the things, and as part of it was the way I grew up, my father never, never said he loved me the entire time that I was a boy or, or later for that matter. But that was kind of that time. And one of the things that I wanted to do was to make sure that I told my kids and my wife that uh, at every Tommy opportunity that I got to tell them that I loved him and I cherished him and, and uh, I cared. Uh, so that, you know, that made a change, you know, in, in my attitude and it changed, changed my whole value system. Yeah, that's right. And when the war ended, did you go right back to U.S. where you stayed there for like recovery? No, when I when the when my tours were over, I you know the war was still going on, you know, but I wasn't. I went back to my other job at Blyville Air Force Base, being a, a, a co-pilot, and right after that, then I upgraded to to aircraft commander and. Uh, uh, with the jobs that, that came along and the flying responsibilities that came with being an aircraft commander. So after all of those, did you feel lucky that you survived since you saw your friends and crew died? Well, um, the answer to that is yes. You know, uh, we should not have survived uh, going through that that target area and the missiles didn't go off. Uh, we recovered uh, the airplane that should not have been recoverable. Mm -hmm. uh, we got shot up, but not anybody on the airplane was physically hurt. Not so much as a scratch. Um, uh, God was instrumental in that whole thing. It was only by the grace of God that we were able to survive. And I think that was that was because, you know, he wanted, it was not time for us to go. He had other things that he wanted us to do, the people that were on that crew. 
for his purposes. So, yeah. Yeah, that's basically what I'm going to know. And thank you for your supporting of my project. Well, you're most welcome. I, I really enjoy, uh, you know, telling war stories and uh, especially the pretty girls. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye.